Hi, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number one, Knowledge Representation with Graphs. In this section of the lecture we are going to talk about knowledge and how to represent it. So let's recap. From the last part of the uh, lecture you saw I have presented you 42. We now are also aware of that 42 can have many different meanings. As being raw data, we can't say exactly what it is. We need more information. So you see here, uh, again, for ChatGPT, giving us several definitions of what number 42 might mean. The first one you might remember, yeah, that was one from the calendar. The second one, that was from psychology. The third one here was from computer science. Then we have another one, what does 42 mean in physics? And of course we have one here for the pop cultural meaning, also referring to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. All what you see here are so-called different contexts. Put into different context, 42 suddenly gets a different meaning. And this of course tells us something about knowledge. We need context. Context is more information that gives us a specific situation in which now a piece of information or a piece of data has a rather specific meaning. Let's look at a specific meaning of 42, let's say in the context of chemistry. Here we see in the field of chemistry number 42 is the atomic number of molybdenum, a chemical element with a symbol of MO. And then it further refers to the atomic number is of an element is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom of that element. And it is used to determine the position of an element in the periodic table. And so on and so on and so on. So it, it's explaining you exactly what number 42 here in the sense or in the context of chemistry, which is there the uh, element molybdenum, what that means. And also what all of the other concepts that are mentioned there are meaning. So we could say here with language of course we can represent knowledge. Of course we are doing that in our everyday li life. We're doing that always. So we can use language as a kind of knowledge representation. What is language? Language is a system of conventional spoken manual or written symbols that combine to convey meaning and by means of which Human beings as members of a social group and participants in its culture express themselves. So that's the lexicon or dictionary based definition of language. And one of the most important functions of language is of course communication. So then how does this act of communication really work? Let's have a look here. So we have a sender and the receiver. So this is the standard diagram of the communication process. We have some kind of information that the sender want to convey to the receiver. Let's say I phrase a sentence with a message. So then I have to speak it. I have to use my voice and as communication channel, I'm using simply the air as a medium between sender and receiver. And then here the message is received with the ear of the receiver and it's decoded into the things that I have tried to convey in my spoken message. However, there are several ways how this information can be flawed. So one of the problems that occurs there might be we might have noise and information loss. So simply imagine you are in a very loud and crowded room and there of course it's difficult to make yourself understandable because simply it's too loud, you can't be heard completely. Another problem might occur in the encoding and decoding. So am I really able to phrase the things that are around in my head and that I want to convey to the receiver and does the receiver really know what I mean by you know, choosing specific words to convey a specific meaning. So there of course there can be differences that depends on the commonly shared experiences and stuff like that. So insufficient encoding and decoding of information also might cause information loss here. Communication is even more complicated. So here is the so-called uh, semiotic triangle that has been introduced by Ogden and Richards already in the 1920s and it dates back farther back to, to Aristotle in the end, which means if I convey or try to denote something with a symbol, a word, an expression of language, like for example here Jaguar, that's a symbol. 
that stands for a rather specific object that I'm denoting with it. However, the word Jaguar is of course ambiguous. It might refer to here to a car, to a cat or also to an operating system. When I'm talking about Jaguar, what appear, appears then in your head is not an individual Jaguar. It's, let's say, an archetype of that. It's a concept. So it's a, not a specific car. It might, of course, you might have a picture of that, but you have a Jaguar car. And of course, another one might have another Jaguar car in his head. And therefore, of course, communication only really works if sender and receiver share the same concept. Then, of course, they understand each other. And of course, also the concept refers to the specific real world object then in the end you are talking about. So that's the semiotic triangle and you will see it again further on in the course of this lecture. So what makes natural language already so difficult? I, I gave you already a glimpse. Here I want to present to you my friend Ferdinand de Saussure. So of course he's one of the, let's say, principal um, linguists, so one of the founders of the discipline of linguistics. Um, he lived in the, in, the, in the 19th century and I'm, I'm making him say here, I'm a linguist, I love ambiguity more than most people. Now let's wait a bit and think about that sentence. And you might see, yeah, of course, it's ambiguous. And ambiguity is one of the difficult things for language and the other thing is, of course, you can do it also the other thing around. Ambiguity means you have one expression that stands for many different concepts. However, you can denote the same thing, the same concept with many different words. That's paraphrasing. So paraphrasing and ambiguity. These are the two major difficult things that make our language so difficult. And ambiguity can occur on many different levels. And of course, this is one of the major obstacles and one of the major difficulties and challenges that we have to solve, for example, in natural language processing. But what we want to do is we want to do formal knowledge representation. Now, since language already is so difficult, it might not be, let's say, the best means for knowledge representation for a machine, because the machine then would also have to learn how to disambiguate the stuff and how to understand it. We need something more formal there. We need a formal knowledge representation, which as you know, or should know, is a field of artificial intelligence. And a formal knowledge representation unambiguously captures the semantics, the meaning of concepts, of properties, of relationships, and of entities. And of course, of specific knowledge domains, which means fields of interest or areas of concern. And this, of course, in a way that the machine can understand it and process it, which is in then in the end as a kind of structured data. So, principal goal would be that machines and computers must be able to understand formal knowledge representations. Now we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to understand? To understand a knowledge representation, what the machine must be able to is, the machine must be able to interpret the knowledge representation in a correct way, in the way as it is intended. So correct interpretation is here the key. And this is what makes it also difficult. But on the other hand, if we enable a computer to interpret our formal knowledge representations always in the correct way, then we also guarantee that the machine is able to, in double quotes, understand what we mean. Understand in the way that it interprets the meaning in the correct way as it was intended. And in the next part of the lecture, we will look at the art of understanding.